one has to be humble about that. So do I think there's more to understand about our minds? Yes. Do I think that there's a pretty uh, good principle foundation for some of the basic stuff? And let me repeat, some of the basic stuff, yes. If you're going to talk about the creativity of a Mozart, um, have I discovered everything you need to know about that? No, I haven't. Will anybody? Stay tuned. You know, I hope someone, you know, is at least stimulated by these thoughts and just carries in directions I can't imagine. This is Brain Inspired. Hey everyone, it's Paul. On today's episode, Steve Grossberg joins me again. So Steve was on episode 82 when we talked a lot about his adaptive resonance theory and some of his principles that have uh, guided him to a long and productive career. At the time, I didn't know it, but uh, Steve was about to release a book and that book is now released. And the book is called Conscious Mind, Resonant Brain, How Each Brain Makes a Mind. And it is a tome of a volume which contains at, at least a nearly complete exposition of all of his uh, theoretical principles and models and how those models account for brain function. And he describes how his models and the resonances in adaptive resonance theory account for our conscious experiences. As you'll hear Steve talk about, you don't have to read the book cover to cover. Um, you can just pick any chapter and dive in because he repeats a lot of the same ideas and principles so that each chapter stands on its own. So on the episode today, we talk about some of those principles. And I was also lucky enough to get a few questions from people like Yuri Bujaki, Jay McClelland, John Krakauer, and a listener, Matt. So those were fun to include, and I hope you enjoy them. Show notes are at braininspired.co slash podcast slash 115. All right, here's the conversation with Steve. Steve, welcome back. How's it, how's it going? How have you been? Congratulations on the giant book that you've released into the world. Thank you. Well, I, I've been as well as one could hope in this crazy pandemic world of ours. Yeah. So um, let's hope everyone can stay as healthy as possible. Well, congratulations on the book. It is a, uh, we talked a little bit about it last time. Uh, on your last visit to the podcast. Uh, and what you said is correct. It is large. It is a fully self-contained and uh, quite a volume. So Yeah. It was a big, big baby, and I still have stretch marks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> so I, I kind of want to know, you know, before we get into topics in the book, uh, I'm kind of interested in, you know, just the process of writing it, because in some sense, uh, I think you must not have struggled too much to write it because it's kind of taking just your body of work and reorganizing it and, and putting it in book form. Uh, did you struggle at all or, or was it a fairly quick process? How'd that go? Well, it was a process that was extended over quite a few years. So just to be self-contained, the book is my magnum opus. I have hundreds of articles and other uh, contributions. But this is the biggie. It's called Conscious Mind, Resonant Brain, How Each Brain Makes a Mind. Then it's listed on Oxford University Press, which published it. But the main listing these days is on Amazon, where I managed to get it sold for a ridiculously low price. Well, how I wrote it was over the years, Quite a few of my colleagues had asked me to try to bring together my main discoveries in a book. And so because of that, I already had a draft of several chapters mm. way back in 1999. Oh, oh wow. <laughs> so it's, it's, it took a while. So, but there were a number of things I didn't understand that I felt if this was going to be my big book, I really wanted to know a little about them. So, 
I set that aside and worked for about 20 more years very hard with a number of gifted PhD students and postdocs to fill in some of those gaps. And like by 2018, I had filled in some of the gaps, including the really big gap of how, where in our brains and even why from an evolutionary perspective, uh, nature discovered conscious states whereby we could see, hear, feel, and know things about the world and how these conscious states enable us to effectively plan and act to realize value goals. And so by 2017, I had published an article on the heart problem of consciousness in the mm-hmm. journal Network, and that was a piece of it. But then I also taught, <coughs> excuse me, an advanced seminar in 2018 that was an integrative uh, seminar about a lot of the concepts and uh, other kinds of discoveries that my colleagues and I have made over the years. And in order to teach that course, I created many hundreds of color PowerPoint slides. And if you look at the book, there are over 600 color figures, and those were PowerPoint slides in my lectures. So that was a huge help. But But in addition, around that time, I became an emeritus professor. And so for the first time in my life, I didn't have to get research grants and to mentor up to 20 at a time, PhD students and postdocs, and usually on 20 different topics, which was (laughs) really exciting, but also quite exhausting. So I had free time. And so uh, I had the foundation, and so I went forward to try to finish the book. And and let me emphasize, I did write the book for a general audience. I wrote it to hopefully be self-contained and non-technical uh, in a conversational style and wherever possible as a series of stories. And I started with perception at the front end, and then moved through cognition and emotion, and finally to action. And I did it uh, for both health and mental disorders. Mm -hmm. Um, Moreover, I wrote it so the chapters could be written, could not be written, could be read on their own without having to read the other chapters. So if you're interested uh, in perception and learning, read that first. If you're interested in how we uh walk or run read that first if you're interested in how our brains break down to generate uh behavioral symptoms of mental disorders like alzheimer's or autism or amnesia or post-traumatic stress <laughs> or hyperactivity disorder or even problems of slow wave sleep you could read about that first in some sense, it's like a giant reference book because just about any topic in cognitive in the cognitive sciences you can you can look it up. Cognitive and neuroscience literatures are vast, and they go back a uh, hundred years. So I would say that this is a book that could um, thread a, a principled uh, path through a number of the fundamental processes. Which, if you're armed with it, it'll make it much easier for you to read literatures. And in fact, hmm. that was true for my students. You know, the training they got from me, uh, many people later on would say, well, how do you, how do you know all this? How do you jump into new areas so readily? And it's really because they had a principled foundation of knowledge. You can never know everything about anything in this world, but but they had that foundation. And the book tries to give you the foundation. And what's paradoxical in a way about it, it's a serious book. But on the other hand, it's also a book written for uh, a general audience, because I believe mm-hmm. that 
since we all have a mind, well, many people have been curious about what's going on in there. And I think this, this is perhaps one of the uh, better uh, sources of that kind of information that people can read about. And so I know various people who were friends in various walks of life who knew that I wrote the book and they bought it and they've been reading it and not everyone reads every chapter, but you know, most of the people would read a good part of the book and enjoy it. I know there's at least one uh, reading group that is uh, dedicating uh, months, I think, to going through step by step through the whole book and discussing it. So it is being, it's actively being read out there. Well, well, I'm, I'm delighted by that. And, and, um, you know, one of the, um, the big themes that comes up in the book is how brain evolution leads to behavioral success. Behavioral success, after all, is what drives the evolution of our brains. It's just mm -hmm. Darwinian selection applied to the mind. And, um, so as a result of that, the theoretical method that led to all my results, I mean, an interesting little fact is that I started 17, I'm 81, I've been working for 64 years, and I never hit a brick wall. And Did we? You were 80 last time we talked. I, I guess you had a birthday. I guess it was over a year ago I, then. I, I My birthday is on New Year's Eve. So I know. Yeah, I couldn't remember how long it had been since we last spoke, so... Well, time flies, so... Yeah. But anyway, so um, I developed a very conservative theoretical method, which always begins with scores or hundreds of parametric psychological facts, because it's on the level of psycho psychology or behavior that drives the evolution of our brain. So if you want to understand, you know, the architecture that arose through evolution, you have to start with psychology. And fortunately, the literature in psychology is one of the largest in the history of science. It's over 100 years old. I mean, even great physicists like Helmholtz, Maxwell, and Mach, in addition to doing physics, they did psychology and sometimes physiology. One of the things you talked about last time was using those large bodies of, uh, of psychological data, behavioral data, and intentionally setting yourself up to um, have intention uh, different um, bodies of behavioral data that don't necessarily seem like they fit together, uh, but you are trying to unify um, through uh, principled means, uh, unify and explain uh, how these two, you know, how these various sets of data can hang together. Well, that that is true, but but I think another way of looking at that is that if you are true to the to the demands of the data. And I mean, the art of modeling is you can have these piles of static curves of this versus that, and you have to go through a speculative leap to imagine how they could have arisen uh, dynamically, moment by moment, in a mind, possibly even a conscious mind. And if you do that, if you can do that, that's the art of modeling, and that can help you to discover principles of organization. And those principles can force you into thinking about new kinds of data that you never even thought you'd know the first thing about. Like, you don't wake up in the morning someday and say, hey, today I'm going to understand Alzheimer's disease. <laughs> I mean, that came in through the back door. It came in through a study of how we learn to attend, recognize, and predict objects and events, and that came came up through my discovery of adaptive resonance theory, or ART, which has become, I think it's fair to say, the leading cognitive neural theory of how we learn to attend, recognize, and predict objects and events in a changing world. And I... I'm willing to say that without embarrassment because all of the foundational 
hypotheses of art, which is AR teachers at the residency, have been confirmed by subsequent psychological and neurobiological data. And art's gone on to explain really hundreds of experiments. And so I think, you know, talking about this brick wall and how, you know, we all want to be able to continue being productive uh, as we go through life, the question is, why has art been so successful? And, and there, um, there are some fundamental reasons which are uh, true throughout my work. And in this case, it's because I was able to derive art. Uh, in 1980, I had a, I have a very well-cited psychological review article that's still the leading theory journal in psychology. I derived that from a thought experiment. And, you know, you may know Einstein in particular was very famous for his thought experiments where he used them to help him derive the laws of general relativity, his so-called elevator thought experiment. What a mm -hmm. thought experiment is, is when you've thought deeply enough about the phenomena that you could see that there are a few simple facts behind it that are really driving what's going on. And here the thought experiment was about a universal problem of error correction. That is, as we're learning, how do we autonomously correct predictive errors? And I was able to show through the thought experiment that adaptive resonance theory is the unique answer. Just using hypotheses that we all know about, you don't have to be a psychologist to know them. We know them because they're ubiquitous environmental pressures that we all experience throughout life. And when a number of them act together on evolution, outcome architectures like art. And in, in thinking about this, I want to comment that the thought experiment these hypotheses never use the word mind or brain. Right. So in a sense, they are providing a universal solution to a certain important class of problems in what I find useful to call autonomous adaptive intelligence. You know, how we're going to be understanding increasingly during this century uh, autonomy in our science and technology. And we already see signs of it through efforts to design uh, self-driving cars, autonomous airplanes, and the like. But the key point is that, you know, I know you want to talk a little about consciousness. I never try to understand consciousness. It's just like you don't wake up in the morning and Say, I'm going to understand Alzheimer's disease. You don't wake up in the morning and say, you understand consciousness. But I always wanted to understand how we learn. Mm -hmm. And, you know, not the least reason being, I was always a student, and that's what I did. I was learning all day. Let me silence my phone. <laughs> but the, the key issue that fascinated me about learning is how we learn so quickly without necessarily forgetting just as quickly. The stability plasticity, the plasticity stability dilemma. The plasticity dilemma, so called. How can our brains be so plastic to learn quickly? Like I learned your face first time I saw you within a matter of seconds and I recognized you today, you know, a year later. <coughs> so I learned quickly and I didn't experience catastrophic forgetting of your face due to the many other faces that I have learned or seen since. Just like when I learned your face, I wasn't afraid that it would somehow drive my mom's face out of my memory. And I call this a solution to the stability plasticity dilemma, how we can learn so quickly without experiencing catastrophic forgetting is something which a lot of AI algorithms, notably deep learning, cannot do. They can experience catastrophic forgetting so that they're uh, unreliable. And 
they're also not explainable in a technical sense. So they're not trustworthy. But let's get back to adaptive resonance theory, what made it possible for art to solve this stability plasticity dilemma was I realized that you need, in addition to the bottom up signals coming from the outside world, you need recognition categories that are gonna be reading out learned top down expectations that are gonna focus your attention on a subset of features that have been activated by bottom up data. I call these the critical features. These are the ones that are going to control predictive success. And attention helps you to disregard the irrelevant features. And when there's a good enough match between the top down expectation that's being read out by the recognition category and the bottom up data, then you can go into a cycle of resonance between that category and those critical features. And it sustains, it, it sustains itself, this uh, positive feedback loop long enough to create the state of resonance synchronizes the firing of the attended critical features and the selected recognition category um, long enough so that the adaptive weights in the bottom of filters and the adaptive weights in the top down expectation learn what they're looking at. And that's why I call it an adaptive resonance. And this particular resonance between a pattern of features and a chosen recognition category is therefore called a feature category resonance. And after I did all that, it then occurred to me that the parametric properties of the critical features in different situations match psychological data about what you were recognizing. And I realized that a feature category resonance is um, uh, supporting conscious recognition. And I got into consciousness in that way through the back door um, and from then I was able to classify six different kinds of conscious resonances for seeing, hearing, feeling, and knowing. And I also asserted that all conscious states are resonant states through this work, but also noted that not all resonant states are conscious states. And moreover, there's quite a bit of brain dynamics that aren't resonant. Yeah, I, was, I wanted to ask you um, why, you know, some resonances, like you just said, are not conscious and why some are. Do, is there a principled way to uh, delineate which ones are and which ones aren't? Well, there's a simple way to do it. If you're resonating with critical features that represent either external qualia like brightness or color or internal qualia like fear or relief emotions, then that kind of resonance will support consciousness. But you can have resonance that doesn't include qualia in them. And the reason is that you have to dynamically stabilize a lot of stuff in the brain through resonance not only uh, conscious quality. So uh, a couple of resonances that um, are not conscious are frontal parietal resonances. That is to say, we have a parietal cortex that's very important in our representations of space and in the control of spatial navigation, among other things. And then we have our frontal cortex that's important in um, planning and you know you have working memory and all sorts of stuff there and if they resonate one of their roles different resonances can control the opening or closing of gates in the basal ganglia which is a different part of the brain entirely and you have to open particular gates in order to enable a percept or a concept or an action to occur. That's how things uh, 
are expressed. And if we know that, how, how that can really muck up your life in Parkinson's disease, mm-hmm. where those gates aren't working properly and it can have both cognitive and emotional and motor effects on people afflicted with and then one other if I can just if you could bear with me just a moment more and I'll shut up. <laughs> there are also entorhinal hippocampal cortices between the entorhinal cortex and the hippocampal cortex. And those are important in regulating the learning of entorhinal grid cells and hippocampal play cells that are terribly important in spatial navigation, in telling us how we know where we are at a given moment. And they don't have, you know, external or internal quality in them either. But if the but but if resonance itself is the key mechanism underlying uh, subjective experience, underlying consciousness, um, whether it's, it's, it's necessary, so is it's necessary but not sufficient. Not sufficient. Yeah. Okay. Because if you don't have uh, critical features resonating that support external or internal qualia representations, then they won't be conscious. Hmm. It's not that the principle of resonance is different; it's the content of the resonance that's different. Okay, I'm gonna have to chew on that a little bit more, Steve. I, I want to back up because I have um, a handful of questions from listeners and and some people you know that uh, I want to make sure we get to. So, if you don't mind, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, start going through a, a few of those here. Sure. Good. Um, so, the first question that I'm gonna ask is from Yuri Buzaki. Uh, he didn't send me audio, so I'm just gonna read uh, the question that he wrote. And actually, he he gave a little blurb in your book. I love his work, by the way. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> He is a marvelous scientist and a delightful man. You know, he, he designed his own house that he recently had to sell. <laughs> what is that? He designed his own house that uh, he, he like designed all yeah, of the... He told me about that and or wrote me about it. And um, we're both crazy Hungarians. Oh, right, right. Oh, right. You share the, the Hungarian, except you're... Huggy kissy Stevie sometimes, which is not a Hungarian uh, disposition generally. <laughs> Depends on the socioeconomic status. <laughs> okay. All right. So Yuri, uh, his, here's his kind of st- statement in question. So the legacy of a great person is always judged by the community. Johannes Kepler didn't know about the four Kepler laws. Newton was the one who named them uh, the Kepler laws. Sir John Eccles didn't think much about uh, the EPSPs and IPSPs for which he got the Nobel. The community has the tendency to link one single discovery to one person. For example, Einstein and relativity, John O'Keefe and place cells. So Yuri says he's curious to know of your many, many findings, which one uh, would you like to be remembered by? And can you say it in one sentence? Well, I'm now primed to say adaptive resonance theory because I'm talking about it. But, but, but adaptive resonance theory is really, a host. The real, really because of what I, I just said about the central role of adaptive resonance theory in learning and consciousness. And the fact that it could be derived from a universal thought experiment about error correction and to the extent to which one of the foundational properties of human intelligence and civilization is our ability to adapt to changing environmental conditions, uh, the ability to solve the stability plasticity dilemma is absolutely foundational. So, I think that the discovery and development of adaptive resonance theory may be uh, one I could hitch my, what do we hitch to these days? Not horses. <laughs> I hitch my Lexus to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's it's got to be, a, 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 you're a Tesla. How about Tesla? 
I don't. <laughs> I don't own a Tesla. Oh, okay. Cool. You're a Lexus guy. All right. Moving on. This is uh, from a listener, Matt, who asks, are there any mysteries or gaps in understanding uh, of the mammalian visual system that keep you awake at night that your various models like art scan, 3D laminar, and so on can't explain? Or do you consider them fairly complete? Um, in either case, what parts do you think are most in need of experimental confirmation? Wow. That's several very challenging questions all at once. Since I haven't given any background yet. Well, yeah, if, yeah, feel free. What keeps you what keeps you up at night? What what bothers you about yeah, go ahead. Well, I'm not kept up at night, but my mind does uh, have scientific dreams. So I am quite capable of sleeping happily through the night. And more so when I was younger, wake up in the morning, understanding something a little better than I did when I went to bed. Hey, man, that does not happen to me. And I'm so jealous that people like you. Uh, well, I think this would only happen with me if I were living with certain paradoxes. My, my ability to make discoveries always seem to be facilitated when in trying to understand data. I should say that if I have one really important gift, it's being able to see to the heart of the data. Mm -hmm. I have acquired technical ability to express the insights about the meaning of data uh, so that it can be quantitatively modeled and tested. But my main gift is really a visual and affective gift that I, I see and feel about the meaning of data. And that leads me to realize that certain facts, if they're viewed together from a certain conceptual perspective, um, create a dilemma, you know, a paradox. Mm -hmm. And they, the pressure of that paradox, like the noise saturation dilemma, um, the stability plasticity dilemma, it's very dialectic. Once I can get that dialectic thing going, then I know I'm on my way to discovery. But it may take a long time and, you know, wake up knowing more in the morning. But the reason that I sometimes did or do is that I would be creating these internal pressures in my mind by living with the data. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's a good, one of the good things about starting work when I was 17. A lot of data has been discovered while I've been a scientist. So it's not like I had to go to school to know it. And Quite often I predicted it, so I was just waiting for it. And so the data become my friends, and they're going strong in my head when I go to bed at night. So, so are there are there sets of data that uh, you're you're itching to uh, explain that that you think about at night, and then wake up a little bit closer <laughs> to the answer? Well, well, I'm reluctant to talk about the things that. I'm currently working on because, you know, sometimes you hit a brick wall and you realize there's something fundamental you didn't realize you needed to know that you did and you put it aside and you might have to work 20 years like I did with consciousness. Mm -hmm. You're still not done with that. No one's done with that before you can come back to it. So uh, I can tell you... Uh, a paper, the topic of a paper I recently submitted to illustrate that what I am currently thinking about is not something you might predict right away from what I've already done. I did submit an article for publication about how we perform and learn uh, music uh, at variable rhythms and beats. So I got very interested in understanding 
at least some aspects of music scientifically. And of course, no one paper can do more than, you know, put your toes in this vast ocean of, of, uh, mysteries. But so that paper is now under review. I have no idea whether <laughs> a happy experience to review. Huh. Yeah. I'm going to play another, um, question for you if you're ready for it. Sure. Hi, Steve. This is John Krakow here. Um, I have got your book. I have not read the whole thing, but I'm getting the gist. Um, so I have a question. I haven't been able to find a comparative section in your book. Um, in particular, the difference between our closest relative, the non-human primate chimpanzees and us, uh, based on your notions of laminar computation and complementary computation, what is the explanation for the huge gap cognitively between us and our closest non-human primates? What framework would you use to explain the difference? Um, it seems like the non-human primates have all the components that would be needed to show the kind of cognition that we show. Um, and I, I just don't see in your book an explanation for that difference. Uh, maybe you can enlighten me. Thank you. All right. That was John Krakauer. Well, well, John, you don't see it because I didn't write about it. Um, and I didn't write about it because, one, I'm more interested in human minds and brains, but two, other people have studied um, <clears throat> this kind of comparative difference. And, you know, two things that people have spoken about, I have nothing new to add, so I'm going to be very brief, is we're bipedal, and so we stand on two feet, and we can use our hands in ways that were essential for the development of civilization, and also our larynx is developed in a way that enables us to articulate a much wider range of sounds. And so the combination of having the physical equipment to develop languages and the physical equipment uh, to learn to use tools um, uh, many people have written about the importance of these kind of adaptations. So, so it's not something necessarily in the brain that needs to be different. You're talking about different morphologies, different uh, body parts and uh, structures. Well, I wouldn't say it quite that way, Paul, because our bodies and our brains are in a continual feedback loop. Right. And fundamental changes in our bodily uh, components and capabilities will force evolutionary developments that will be in a kind of statistical equilibrium with them. You know, that's why, for example, if God forbid, uh, you know, you lose an arm in an accident, there will be a remapping in your cortex of the area that used to control your arm. And it could be taken over by quite a different mental faculty, but often one that's close to it on the cortical map, where your limb representation mm -hmm. was. Mm -hmm. So there is a, a feedback loop that maintains a dynamic equilibrium between body and brain, and therefore mind. All right, very good. I've got one more question here for you. Are you ready for it, sir? I think you'll recognize this person. Oh, Jay, hi. Hi, Steve. Congratulations on your outstanding book. I have a question about the relationship between adaptive resonance theory and uh, the dynamic flow of consciousness. I think of resonance um, as like settling into a kind of a, an attractor state um, but I also often experience uh, a feeling of a dynamic flow. For example, when I'm listening to Yo-Yo Ma play the cello or 
um, watching um, a tennis match in progress, I have this experience of the flow uh, of action rather than anything that's at all ever static. And uh, I just wondered how uh, you think about that from the point of view of adaptive resonance theory. There you go, Jay McClellan. Well, that is a very good question. And no one ever said that resonances are static. I mean, one, you know, a key issue is if you want to be able to learn something new, you have to pay attention to it long enough uh, for the resonance to drive changes in adaptive weights. But movement control interacts with resonance in a very dynamic way. So in particular, um, you know, I, I was often struck when, when I would go from parking my car at the university to my office, there was a long uh, um, corridor outside. And at the end of the corridor, which might have been 50, 75 feet away, you might <clears throat> see someone walk past uh, with a lot of bright sunlight behind them, so they're just a silhouette. And, you know, I could recognize the person from one or two steps or even sometimes just from their silhouette. So resonances are dynamic. And there's nothing in the concept that forces it to be static. But, you know, whenever you're giving an exposition of a concept, you sort of start with the simpler parts. Right. But nothing in the concept requires, in fact, it's very often the case in language that before you can get off the ground in a lot of dynamic behavior, you have to study things like working memory. How do we temporarily store sequences of events occurring in time so that we can learn to group them together into uh, plans and skilled actions and so on and so forth? And each of the items that are going into the working memory are active for a very short amount of time. So the resonances are continually being reset. That's why no less an important concept in art than resonance is what happens when you get a big enough mismatch. The mismatch triggers a reset and a memory search or hypothesis testing. Now, in the case of storing sequences and working memories to control sequential dynamic behaviors, which is part of what I think Jay may have in mind, um, all that you're really doing is mismatching a momentary resonance. You know, a certain pattern came in, it grabbed a category, starts to resonance, relayed out of there. The next pattern comes in, causes a mismatch only because you were resonating on the previous category. But what Gail Carver and I proved is you get direct access to the to the category for the new pattern if it's familiar. And so there's no deep search here. You just have resonance reset, resonance reset, resonance reset, resonance reset, store, 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 learn, learn, learn. And the question is, how do we discover what combinations of sequentially stored items are going to be predictive to determine um, uh, what we should do next. And one of the chapters, uh, I forget, maybe it was chapter 13, discusses that in particular, why and how not everything that's happening may be stored in that working memory, but only things that are task relevant at that moment. So it's not just art in the simple sense of category learning. In fact, if you go, I forget which chapter. Um, well, I have my book here. Let yeah, me go ahead. Go ahead. Um, and I maybe I can show you the figure I have in mind. 
So that figure is on page 520 in my book. It's called The Predictive Art Architecture. And what that shows is that on the one hand, adaptive resonance in the simple uh, sense that Jay <coughs> was mentioning and concerned that it's not sufficient, which it definitely is not, uh, that kind of resonance goes on in infratemporal cortex, in particular posterior infratemporal cortex. By the time you get to anterior infratemporal cortex, it's just one more brain region, you can learn in varying object categories. That is to say, I could recognize Paul's face from different angles, different orientations, different positions in the scene without having to learn all of those exemplars. So it solves this big combinatorial explosion problem. But everything else in that whole architecture is doing other stuff. It's organizing sequential events in time. It's providing evaluation of them through reinforcement learning motivation. It is pre-processing them through perceptual multiple perceptual stages to do what I call hierarchical resolution of uncertainty. So, you know, like the retinal image we get if you want to look at vision, it's very incomplete because we have a huge blind spot where all the retinal veins come together from the optic nerve. Mm -hmm. So it's blind and it's as big as the photosensitive fovea. And you have nourishing veins that are covering the whole retina to keep up with that incredibly fast metabolism. So there are a lot of places on the retina that don't receive a light signal. And yet we are not aware of that. And it's crucial that we complete the representation because otherwise there would be big gaps in our representation, which we couldn't look at or reach to. And that has survival consequences. And that takes a lot of processing stages. I call it hierarchical resolution of uncertainty. And then if you ask, well, how do you know what stage the representation is complete enough to base action on it, whether looking or reaching, that's when you have a surface shroud resonance that creates a state of conscious seeing. And then you use that visual representation that you consciously see to direct your actions. But all that um, stuff is just a small part of the brain. It's just individual objects. And when you're dealing with motion, um, you know, it's a whole different stream. So you have to, you have to inter integrate all this information through time. So I totally agree with Jay. And the book does what it can to describe processes for doing that. But every chapter starts um, de novo. I try to make it self-contained. I could have written a second book based on the first book for more advanced yeah. Oh yeah. Locations. Yeah. But but I agree with Jay, but but if you go to page five twenty of the book in the predictive art architecture and read that chapter, you'll see that there's a lot going on to enable us to integrate events sequentially in time and uh, et, cetera, et cetera, et cetera, Important dynamically changing experiences for humans include understanding speech and music. And to do this, we solve what's called the cocktail party problem. This problem arises because auditory communication often takes place in an environment with multiple sound sources that are active simultaneously, like when we talk to a friend at a noisy party. But despite the noise, we can often track our friend's voice, even though harmonics from other speakers' voices may overlap those of our friend. We can do this because our auditory system can separate multiple overlapping sound sources into distinct mental objects or auditory streams. This process was called auditory scene analysis in the classical 
1990 book by Al Pregman. By isolating and tracking a single voice or instrument in a noisy situation, we can understand what's being said or played. But that raises the question, how do we do this when speech or music is intimately occluded by noise, as in a noisy party? I introduced the art stream model in 2004 with three collaborators to explain how this happens. Art stream applies basic art principles and mechanisms in the auditory domain, including the art matching rule for top-down attentional focusing and resonant conscious hearing. It's also quite remarkable that art stream includes neural designs that also help to explain seemingly quite different competences, such as how do humans represent and understand what's called place value numbers. Place value numbers are numbers like a hundred, a thousand, and so on. Other animals can represent, represent small numbers in order to forage for food, but only humans can represent large numbers like 2,000. There you go, Jay. Thanks. Thanks, everyone who submitted questions. So, Steve, going, going back to John Krakauer's question, um, I just I, I kind of had a follow-up question. I'm curious if you think that there are any undiscovered, yet-to-be-discovered principles that we will need to um, to account for the nature of our human-like higher cognitive uh, thought, right? Our our ability to think. You know, other animals they can't think. We can think, right? Uh, are there undiscovered principles that that uh, we might need to elucidate those? Um, or different math. Like one of the things that we talked about last time is. Let's try to first. Let me yeah. let me try to first get to what you just asked because. Of course, the whole point of discovering something is new. You don't know it until you discover it. <laughs> sure. So that, that's all I could say about that. Another more general way of saying that is I never could predict the present, so I can't predict the future. So, And I think that's one has to be humble about that. So do I think there's more to understand about our minds? Yes. Do I think that there's a you know, a pretty uh, good principle foundation for some of the basic stuff. And let me repeat, some of the basic stuff, yes. So, and uh, I depend on that. I, like, for example, I mentioned art and music. If you're going to talk about the creativity of a Mozart, um, have I discovered everything you need to know about that? No, I haven't. Will anybody stay tuned? <laughs> One of the things we talked about last time, and you go through this history in the book as well, uh, was the need for a new kind of mathematics to start to explain uh, processes uh, in our minds and brains. And the division between physics and, you know, essentially biological sciences and um, so, you know, one of the things that you spend a lot of time, a lot of time doing is inventing these new mathematics, looking at the, the dynamics and the different using differential equations to model these things. And I'm curious if you think, you know, building on that last question, and I, uh, you know, I, I'm hazarding this because uh, I think I know what your answer is going to be. But do you envision needing a, a further uh, new mathematical approach or do we have the mathematical tools now to uh, understand, to go further and understand thoughts and, and the like? Well, again, I feel that this is the kind of thing that is inherent to the discovery process. Mm -hmm. In my life, all of my work was driven by a passionate involvement with large amounts of data. Do I now 
see lots and lots of data that I feel I don't understand the way I felt I didn't when I was very young? And the answer is generally no. Mm -hmm. So much of the data I hear or see today, I can say, yes, well, I could see, you know, that's a variation of that to demonstrate it in a a rigorous uh, theoretical model with all due parametric simulations would take three to five years with a collaborative team. Do I have time to do that? I don't. (laughs) But do I feel that that's something sufficiently novel in a principled way that I want to really study it? Rarely. And when I do come upon such a piece of data, I do jump in with both feet, but really for my personal enlightenment. And if I then feel I can write something about it that's sufficiently clear that people might understand what I'm trying to say and find it useful as a first step toward more quantitative work, I will do so. But but no, I don't feel that there's a ton of um, phenomena out there that, you know, basic experiments when it comes to higher forms of creativity, you know, like a Mozart or mm-hmm. Picasso. Uh, oh, yes, there's so much. But wh- what's the data? Right. You can't build theories without data. And so at some point, if there aren't enough data, you can try to gain qualitative insight and um, and personal satisfaction, but that isn't doing science anymore. As, as to new kinds of math, there are new kinds of math being continually discovered. Um, often, they get increasingly abstract. Some of right. Greatest discoveries of the 20th century were codifying and unifying and algebraizing insights that originally came from nature. You know, people like Gauss and Riemann, you know, start with cartography, you know, stuff like that. Um, and as they get further and further from nature, one can wonder or uh, to what extent uh, they will have the kind of power you want. But but then, you know, you go to high-energy physics and you have string theory, which builds in, you know, there are new mathematical challenges there. So as nature forces us to discover concepts that we can use to understand natural phenomena, I think that is, has been a very rich resource. Some parts of mathematics have already done that death, mm-hmm. but the parts are still uh, moving along. Um, but, you know, what I'm hoping is that, especially as computer resources get better and better, that right. more and more uh, mathematical concepts and tools can be used to start helping with societal problems. And we see that in ways we take for granted, like the daily weather report. You know, weather reports uh, have predictive models. That's math. You know, we didn't yeah. know have that. There was a time when you wouldn't want to predict more than a day or two in advance. Right, right. And now with all the turbulence due to global warming, the models aren't quite as good anymore because it's so nonlinear and so turbulent you know, they'll probably need to refine and further develop those models. But, you know, what we're doing now with Google, all of this, you know, came out of mathematical logic originally. And then there are going to be analog computations that are more human-like, which will, I think, in humanoid robots, you'll have more analog or computation that can be embodied in um, nanoscale VLSI chips to embody the increasingly human kind of intelligence, along with, you know, advanced variations of unknown 
uh, computation to compute at unbelievable speeds the kind of things humans can't do very well, like multiplying huge matrices mm. in a mm. slash. And so we'll have these kind of hybrid kinds of intelligence, I think, in future mobile uh, adaptive robots and other intelligent agents. I want to switch gears. I'm aware of our time, and I I have a couple of questions that I I want to make sure that we get in, and then if if we can, uh, if there's if there's time after, we can dive into any any of the topics in the book that you'd like to talk about. You know, one of the things that you you emphasized in la- the last time that we spoke was how appreciative you are for having been able to um, have a long, productive, continuous career. Uh, since you were 17, right, essentially, when you, when you began. One of the things I want to know is how you got so damn lucky to to know your calling so young and and uh, to know how to implement it. And But really, what I'm wondering is how important it is to have like early life, not just an, a calling necessarily, but early life foundational ideas and and successful, you know, in your case, models, right? For how important that is to have it early on, uh, to have later on an impactful contribution to the field. Like an, an old guy like me can't, be, I couldn't begin now in a new field and have an impactful contribution, right? Well, you know, I'm blocking now, but some of the most, Oh, oh, I I almost got it. Some of the greatest uh, pure mathematicians uh, came to math relatively late in life. But I thought math in particular was one in which uh, youth serves well. Well, there are counterexamples that are so, that are so uh, vivid that um, there are counterexamples. Okay. Yeah. People who, both in France and Germany, some of the greatest mathematicians um, who started later. There are also, you know, for example, when you start very often depends on how much knowledge you need before you can even know how to describe a problem that's of interest. So in the old days, number theory was a great field to start young in, like Fermat, you know, because you could say, how many ways are there to do this and this? And there was no literature, but now one of the most abstract areas of pure mathematics is number theory. So even to know what people care about now, you'd have to study quite yeah. a bit. Yeah. So, you know, the accessibility of the phenomena. So that's why I was so lucky. I might have mentioned, you know, I grew up in New York City and in New York, there were only basically buildings, people and pets. And so people always fascinated me. And then when I took introductory psychology, as a freshman, and I realized that there was a quantitative database about how people learn, I was all in. But it took more than that because I was also very lucky. I I always worked very hard in school because my parents didn't have money, so I had to win mm-hmm. scholarships, so I and, you know, I'm a Jewish, and there was a Jewish quota, only a very small fraction of Jewish boys from New York could get funding to go to a college out of town, although CUNY was a great place. It wouldn't have been the end of the world. And, of course, girls couldn't get money at all. Yeah. And and so um, uh, I chose to go to Dartmouth, not only because of good things I read about Dartmouth, and notably I read there was a senior fellow program where in your final senior year you could do research, but also because I was a competition machine in high school. I went to Stuyvesant. I had to be first to get a scholarship. 
and you know, competition can become an end in itself. And I needed to switch from working to compete to working for love because I love what I was doing. And when I went to Dartmouth, I was able to make that transition. But I was lucky too. Um, the chairman of psychology was Al Pastorf, or the chairman of mathematics with John Kennedy. I worked like a dog at Dartmouth to be come first in my class and professors would pass around my final exams because they were so notorious. I was so overprepared. And so I got to the attention of people who could help me get a senior fellowship. And therefore I became the first joint major in mathematics and psychology at Dartmouth and launched my life there. Uh, and in fact, it's quite a wonderful symbiosis uh, due to Kameny in part that the uh, new psychology and math buildings of Dartmouth and I joined at the hip. But they were both remarkable men. Al Hastoff became uh, a provost and vice president at Stanford. He was much loved, I, I read. And John Kameny was a co-development, co-developer of, um, the computer language basic and also of time sharing computer networks. He was also one of Einstein's assistants. So I always felt that I was, you know, um, in the presence of something really quite, um, transcendent when I was interacting with John the the last time we talked also um, you expressed the notion that the biological sciences have really lacked or lagged rather uh, in mathematical and computational analyses right um, but you know from my perspective so my PhD is in quote unquote computational neuroscience and it seems like these days, if you don't have a model, you can't do anything, you can't get published anyway. And I'm curious whether you think that, um, you know, math and modeling has sort of caught caught up. Are, are, are they up to speed now with experimental training in the neurosciences and beyond? Well, in, in my experience, it's very difficult uh, for a student to learn enough data to really, you know, live with it, to mm -hmm. passionately engage with it, and enough relevant technique to know how to model with it. Uh, most departments are mainly experimental. They might have a smattering of methods. Uh, some departments, like for example, in the Department of Mathematics and Statistics at BU, where I've been a professor for many years and I'm now emeritus, there's a very fine group in studying the statistics of neural experiments, neurophysiological experiments. But they don't model what the meaning of the data are. They're just trying to show, you know, how to how to statistically analyze very noisy and complete data, which is mm -hmm. important. But but outside in the in the broader field, do you see an increase in the appreciation for and the training for uh, computational and modeling techniques? Well, I think certainly I can't track the whole world, and I do believe the European program does have a center in Paris. Mm. I don't know what they teach. In my own experience in the past, usually people teach what they want students to know to work in their lab. Mm -hmm. And that's not what we taught. We not only taught in those 18 courses stuff that had been discovered in our department, we try to prepare our students for whatever a uh, job they would get in the broader field of psychology, neuroscience, uh, technology, biological and spark technology. And that's why they did so well. 
um, I see very little of that. And part of the reason is that a lot of the people um, never learned that stuff in school, a lot of the leaders. And that's it, it takes an enormous political effort for people who don't know the work to try to hire younger people who can teach it, um, will learn it and then teach it. Uh, the funding in academia is very difficult, especially if it's at the research level. So there are all sorts of social political factors. Mm -hmm. But the answer is no, not being done to the best of my knowledge. All right. And if I'm wrong, I want to know it because it would make me feel much better. So, Steve, we're coming up on the end, and I, I want to ask one more meta question about the book itself. The book itself, so so Terrence Deacon wrote this book called Incomplete Nature, and it is a difficult read and um, is long. Um, and he, one of his colleagues, actually, then, I think because of that, wrote kind of a summary, a short summary book uh, to th that someone could even use as like an introduction to the larger volume. Uh, your book is not like Incomplete Nature in that, I mean, it's different in many ways, but it is long uh, and uh, it does take time. And like you said, uh, the last time we spoke, people don't have attention spans anymore and people have very little time. So I'm curious if you thought about uh, having, you know, seeking either writing yourself or seeking out someone else to write, you know, just as as condensed as possible uh, a short volume that could almost be a companion piece or uh, an entryway into the larger piece? Well, uh, keep in mind that really, depending on who you talk to, the book really first started really being distributed in July. Mm -hmm. And now it's the middle of September. So the book is really very new. Oh, yeah, sure. And and I'm very much engaged with people who are writing me and asking me about this and that and the other thing. Do I think that I would have the energy to write a shorter thing myself? At first, that was what I was going to do. And then I had, you know, the feeling, been there, done that. But what I have been thinking, which may be useful, see, this book came out of a course. Mm -hmm. This is the book. It's based on my lectures. Yeah. And the prerequisites to take my course were zip. Kids took my course who weren't in psychology or neuroscience. Mm-hmm. I had students who were artists in my course, and they got a lot out of it. Now, did they understand everything that we covered? Well, do students ever understand everything? <laughs> I remember sitting with a young colleague of mine years ago. I had just given a lecture, and we were on the train together. It must have been in New York, going to, in the same direction. He said, you know, when you give the lecture, everything seems so clear, so lucid in my mind. But yeah. as a function of time, it just yeah. is. And we talk about the fact that, and he said, that's why I like hearing you lecture on the same thing more than once. But the same thing is true with a book. You know, the book is written to yeah. be independent chapters, that is to say, independent lectures. Yeah. That were given to kids who knew nothing. Um, and you pick what interests you and you take your time with it and don't try to read everything. Read what interests you. I am thinking though that I might try to, uh, make it useful as a course book by putting, making a little booklet of exercises. Like a textbook, essentially. So that it could be used yeah. to teach a class. Mm -hmm. Now, that in itself is a challenge because, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's not going to replace a required course because 
there's blood involved in getting courses through a required curriculum, and people don't want to shed any more blood, but there are electives. And this is the kind of elective that I think could fascinate people. Remember, these kids came to my course with no book. Now, if they came to a course by any teacher, they would have the book. And don't say, well, but they didn't write the book because I know <clears throat> that when I became an assistant professor at MIT of mathematics, the first courses I taught, I never learned the subject. And I'm not the only one. <laughs> so you read the book and you learn the book. Yeah, yeah. And then everyone says, including my PhD advisor, John Colorado, a very famous and wonderful mathematician, he said, that's the only way you can learn anything in mathematics. You have to teach it. So I want to make it easy to use my book in an elective course. Oh, that's a good idea. I think that's actually a great place to end it. Um, so I want to say again, congratulations on the book. I hope it continues flying off the shelves. Well, I don't know if it is flying off the shelf. Oxford hasn't told me. Oh, really? They've flown off the shelf. I keep asking, how many, how many? Oh, you yeah. should look at Twitter. I just, uh, I've seen a lot of people posting photos of the book. And, you know, like I told you about that reading group and stuff. So I know that it, uh, it's, it's getting distributed pretty well, at least in my, from my small, narrow viewpoint, I suppose. But Well, I'm relieved to hear it. I do think the book, because it does try to talk about things concerned the human condition, you know, like the, the last chapter where it talks about yes, the yeah. biological basis of creativity and religion and morality and why superstition and self-defeating beliefs persist so much in certain social environments. I think there are lessons that a lot of people might find thought-provoking. That was actually one of my favorite parts of the book was um, toward the end there, when you are relating the short-term memory and long-term memory laws to uh, for for brain function and processing to biological uh, phenomena, it's universal right? developmental code. I mean, I love the example of how going from a blastula to a gastrula, primitive uh -huh. blood. You know, at two sides of the blastula cells become active, mm -hmm. and one of them starts growing a pathway, which then has becomes adhesive to the other cells. And so that's a kind of long-term memory. The activity is like short-term memory. The growth of the connection, which happens in our brains too, yeah, yeah. morphogenesis, and then dynamically stabilizes itself and then there's a very ancient homologue between nerve cells and muscle cells. Well, this connection is like a muscle. It pulls, and it pulls the cells closer to each other to form the gastrula through a short-term memory, long-term memory interaction. Now, that's just a comment, and I first published it in 1978 in an article I called Communication memory and development, I mean, with a title like that, you know that, you know, I'm going to be doing a little speculation, especially in 1978. But those concepts, I don't think have still been investigated with what we now have, are amazingly more powerful biological methods and mm -hmm. imaging methods and living tissue. And, you know, I hope someone you know, is at least stimulated by these thoughts and just carries in directions I can't imagine. How's Gail? She's good. She's good. good. Okay, good. I just wanted to make sure. I was going to ask you about working, you know, having uh, getting to work uh, so closely with someone who's also the love of your life. So, Well, it's a blessing if you can get it. But, you know, I mean... <laughs> she is the love of my life and my best friend and one of the wisest people I've ever met. But, you know, also when you're both working together in the same house and on 
sometimes on the same project. You know, in my work, I always wanted to be intellectually ruthless, but emotionally supportive uh, to my students, because, you know, you're not doing anyone a favor if you say, you know, to their favorite idea, which is a, a lump of garbage. Oh, very interesting, very interesting. Right. You know, it's important to try to not attack it, but to use it as an opportunity to say, you know, what may not be correct there, and then to use that as an opportunity to move in a maybe more productive direction, keeping in mind that, you know, a person is giving you their heart on their hand by giving you their first, yeah. Yeah. first personal idea. So that's very um, <laughs> important. But when you're working at home yeah. with, and you're both <coughs> incredibly powerful thinkers and passionately engaged, it can sometimes get heated. And <laughs> no. Among, <laughs> among other things, Gail and I realized the big mistake is to not only not work together, but not to answer our telephone after dinner because students and other colleagues were calling us up to ask us questions well into the night. Hmm. So we had to have ground rules, and it worked out really well. But Gail has done a lot of work solo and with other collaborators, as have I. And in both our cases, a lot of our most foundational work was solo work where we broke into yep. total new areas, but where we had a very productive interactions were in developing a series of art algorithms and architectures that are very much using technology there, among other things. So it just goes to show why we never hit a brick wall, because we were true to the method. And we were, you know, not trying to do anything with a clue, we respected the data. So, there's hoping. No brick walls for me, I hope. No brick walls. Well, Steve, uh, keep staying true and carry on and be well. And thank you for the time today. And thank you for your interest. I appreciate it. Brain Inspired is a production of me and you. I don't do advertisements. You can support the show through Patreon for a trifling amount and get access to the full versions of all the episodes, plus bonus episodes that focus more on the cultural side but still have science. Go to braininspired.co and find the red Patreon button there. To get in touch with me, email paul at braininspired.co. The music you hear is by The New Year. Find them at thenewyear.net. Thank you for your support. See you next time.